Hello from uh, Manila, Philippines. Uh, my name is uh, Eugene Zukov, and I am ADB's Director General for Central and West uh, Asia Regional Department. And I am uh, greatly honored to welcome you all today to this CARAC high-level session as a part of ADB's 55th Annual General Meeting. Today we try to enjoy the best of both uh, worlds by holding this uh, important event in hybrid uh, format. And I warmly welcome our speakers and audience physically present here in Manila. And I also welcome our speakers and participants who are joining us today online. Our topic today is regional cooperation for green and resilient development. Our view is that the CAREC region's green and resilient development requires robust policies and actions for macroeconomic resilience, public health resilience, and disaster risk management. Why? Because the region is highly exposed to various shocks and disasters, and cooperation can help us to prepare better. We are delighted to have government leaders, experts, and private sector risk management industry representatives with us today to offer their perspectives. According to CAREC study, only floods and earthquakes cause an average annual loss of 4.7 billion across our region. Recent disaster events in CAREC region, including the devastating floods in Pakistan, have revealed the vulnerability of government's budgets that have been already heavily affected by the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Innovative disaster risk finance solutions need to be implemented to manage the economic impacts of disasters, eventually strengthening the physical resilience and financial resilience of a government's fiscal budgets, as well as private sector, especially micro, small and medium sized enterprises, farmers, and the most vulnerable households. Today, we will aim to learn what it means in practice to implement a risk-informed regional developmental program focusing on macroeconomic resilience, public health resilience, and disaster risk management. We also will discuss innovative regional financing solutions and sustainable regional investments to address risks. In the first part of the session, we will hear from three distinguished speakers. Mr. Shijun Chang, Director General of the Department for International Economic and Financial Cooperation, Ministry of Finance from People's Republic of China. Mr. Shixin Chen, the Vice President for Operations One of the Asian Development Bank. And last but not least, Ms. Mami Mizutori, Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction or UNDRR. Then we will start engaging in a panel discussion with our distinguished government representatives from the People's Republic of China, Georgia, Pakistan, and Tajikistan about the current circumstances of the CAREC member countries facing and their responses to the challenges. We are also very pleased to welcome a distinguished guest from Mexican government who will share with us his experience. And we also receive valuable inputs on practical solutions for NDRR and from the private sector risk management industry leader later in the panel discussion. A Q&A session will follow this high-level panel discussion. So I would encourage participants both here and, and uh, online to actively ask questions and share your observations during the event uh, using the pigeonhole uh, uh, application. Before inviting Mr. Shijun Chen, the DG of Department for International Economic and Financial Cooperation at the Ministry of Finance, at PRC, to give uh, his welcome remarks. Let me take this opportunity to recognize the People's Republic of China chairmanship of the CAREC program this year. We are delighted to work closely with the PRC for the CAREC's major deliverables this year. Mr. Cheng, the floor is yours. Honorable representatives from CARIC member countries, distinguished Vice President Chen, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to attend the CARIC high-level event today. First of all, on behalf of PRC, 
I would like to extend our warm welcome to all attendees and express sincere appreciation to ADB for the hard work in organizing this important event. This forum is taking place at a time when the pandemic, food and energy security risks, sustained inflation, climate change, and other uncertainties continue to pose a grave challenge to the world. The economic recovery in this region remains fragile and difficult. Against this backdrop, the theme of the forum, Regional Cooperation for Green and Resilient Development, is relevant and timely. China assumes the chairmanship of CARIC and will co-host CARIC Ministerial Conference with CDB this year. We believe that this forum is a good opportunity for CARIC members to share views on strengthening post-pandemic resilience of the CARIC region, which will be helpful for us to prepare the Ministerial Conference. Taking this opportunity, I would like to make three recommendations on promoting green and resilient development of CARIC region. First, jointly promote regional economic growth through enhancing policy coordination and practical cooperation. CARIC members should strengthen macro policy dialogues and coordination, keep regional industry and supply chains stable, promote trade and investment facilitation to maintain economic and financial stability. Meanwhile, CARIC members should deepen cooperation in traditional areas, such as infrastructure, tourism, and agriculture, and explore new cooperation areas, such as digital economy and clean energy to provide new growth impetus. Moreover, CARIC should strengthen the alignment with member countries' development strategies and other multilateral initiatives, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, to seek development synergies. Second, improve regional health system and maintain the pandemic in a joint effort. CARIC members should implement CARIC Health Strategy 2030 including developing an intersectoral framework and establishing a surveillance and early warning system to ensure a joint response to public health emergencies to enhance resilience of the regional health system. In addition, CARIC could strengthen coordination with World Health Organization and other relevant institutions to seek their support and guidance. Third, explore more risk mitigation instruments to enhance natural disaster resilience. Given that the region are highly exposed to risks from natural hazard and climate change, CARIC members should take a coordinated and holistic disaster risk management approach, covering risk understanding, risk reduction, risk financing, and risk transfer. Specifically, CARIC members should further explore natural disaster risk financing tools, including disaster bonds, insurance, and other risk transfer mechanisms. This will significantly help member countries to manage disaster risks and provide alternative solutions to respond to disasters. In this regard, we highly appreciate ADB for supporting CAC members to address various risks, especially launching CIPRO and APVAX, to assist members to cope with the impact of the pandemic, improve public health system, and foster economic recovery. Going forward, we encourage the bank to mobilize more financial and intellectual resources to support CAC members to maintain macroeconomic stability, improve public health system, and tackle disaster risks. In addition, we expect the CARIC Institute as regional knowledge hub to launch more well-designed training programs to
to facilitate knowledge sharing and enhance the capability of member countries to respond effectively to national and regional challenges while conducting researches to provide tailored policy recommendations and knowledge solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, since the beginning of this year, in the face of the complex and green developing environmental at home and abroad, the Chinese government has taken effective and holistic measures on pandemic control while supporting economic and social development. We launched a compre comprehensive macroeconomic package to stabilize the economy in a timely manner, paving the way for sustained recovery of the Chinese economy. It will provide a strong impetus for the stabilization and recovery of the Carrick region, also the world economy. Last year, President Xi Jinping of China proposed the Global Development Initiative define eight aspects, including COVID-19 response and vaccines, climate change and the green development as cooperation priorities. This initiative unleashes new potential for global and regional cooperation on the management of public health, natural disaster, and other risks. This year, at the chair of CARI, China will work with ADB member country, uh, uh, CARIC member countries and ADB to promote more pragmatic cooperation in areas, especially post-pandemic recovery, agriculture and food security, climate change and energy transition. China stands ready to work with CARIC members, ADB and other development partners to promote economic recovery and the shared prosperity in the post-pandemic era, and make more contribution to the green and the resilient development of Carrick region. Lastly, I hope all representatives could have a fruitful discussion today. I wish the, uh, the session a big success. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chen. We are very grateful to the PRC for sharing their experience ineffective uh, disaster risk reduction and response to contribute to the CARIC region's resilient development. Um, we will be posting all the welcome remarks uh, on our website in the entirety. So our next uh, speaker is ADB's Vice President for Operations Area 1, Mr. Shixin Chen. VP Chen, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Distinguished uh, Director General Zhu Jincheng, uh, Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, special session organized by the CARIC program during the ADB's uh, 50, uh, 55th annual meeting. In the last two years, ADB together with our development member, country, development member countries uh, DMCs put a significant into fighting COVID-19, mitigating the problems brought by the pandemic, and supporting DMCs on the path to grow uh, to recovery through structural reforms, financial support, and uh, capacity development. Now we are beginning to see the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Yet there are still critical challenges ahead that are testing our uh, economy's resilience, particularly in the Carrick region, in terms of uh, climate change, natural disasters, food security, and uh, energy security. I would like to share three things we can do through Carrick program to revitalize the regional economic in a green, resilient, and the inclusive way. First, streamline a green and a resilient strategy into upstream activities. For instance, ADB works with its DMCs to integrate climate change adaptation and mitigation into the country partnership strategies. ADB is currently undertaking upstream climate assessments in Pakistan 
Tajikistan and uh, Uzbekistan in the agriculture and the natural resources sector. ADB is also supporting the region's DMCs to increase renewable energy for energy security, such as uh, supporting energy sector reforms, as well as enabling business environment to promote uh, private sector participation in Pakistan and uh, Uzbekistan. Second, enhance rural development and food security, in particular for vulnerable groups. In the Karakur region, the agriculture sector is, uh, is uh, characterized by the low productivity, limited connectivity, a lack of uh, resilience to market volatility and threatened by climate change. This will continue to hinder food security as well. Enhancing rural development and food security could be met on the CARIC program by improving rural livelihoods, support agriculture commercialization, boosting productivity, competitiveness, and the resilience of the sector. As such, it is critical to help DMCs enhance human capital, maintain macroeconomic stability, and promote inclusive growth in the post-COVID-19 pandemic. Third, strengthening capacity development and the knowledge sharing. ADB recently approved a regional TA for de uh, delivering a climate change strategy for Central and uh, West Asia. It aims to support the development of knowledge solutions to DMCs in Central and West Asia. It will include the delivery of strategy and an action plan to strengthen the integration of climate change in ADB financed interventions in regional DMCs. I hope through the CARIC program, more best practices in terms of uh, climate resilience can be shared in the region, including natural resources management, green infrastructure, nature-based solutions, and disaster risk management. As you may know, ADB is uh, strongly committed to support climate action. ADB has raised its ambition to deliver $100 billion in climate financing from 2019 to 2030. Yesterday, ADB announced a plan to provide at least $14 billion over 2022 to 2025 to ease a worsening food crisis and improve food security against the impacts of climate change and the biodiversity loss in Asia and the Pacific. As a trust partner and the honest broke, we are committed to working together with all of you to ensure that development in Karak region follows a green, resilient, and inclusive path. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to the interesting discussions and wish you all a very successful session. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, VP Chen. For the keynote address, we are honored to have our key development partner, represented by Ms. Mami Mizutori, Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Ms. Mizutori, the floor is yours. Dear, Dear Mr. Chen, Director General, Department of International Economic and Financial Cooperation, Ministry of Finance of the People's Republic of China. Distinguished participants, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Vice President Xi Chen of the Asian Development Bank to invite the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, UNDRR, to this important Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation CARIC program high-level session on regional cooperation for green and resilient development. It is the mandate of UNDRR to bring governments, stakeholders, 
and communities together to reduce disaster risk and losses to ensure a safer, more sustainable future. Without doubt, the climate emergency is the biggest threat facing the planet and humanity. 90% of major disasters of the last 20 years are related to climate emergency in one way or another. Their impacts make sustainable development unattainable. Against this dire reality, and with adaptation and resilience being a strong focus of COP27 at Sham El Sheikh this November, I firmly believe that reducing existing disaster risks and avoiding the creation of new risks, this is the key to enhancing sustainable development and building climate resilience. That is why we need to urgently accelerate the implementation of the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction at all levels, local, national, regional and global. While I highly appreciate Carrick's dialogue on this topic, fortunately I will not be able to be with you in Manila today. But I am pleased that my colleague Ms. Genty Kirschwood, Chief of the Global Risk Analysis and Reporting Section, will be representing UNDRR at your high-level panel discussion. I wish you a very fruitful event and look forward to further cooperating with the Asian Development Bank towards the COP27 agenda and beyond to support the Carrick countries in their regional cooperation for a green and resilient development. Thank you very much. We thank Ms. Mizatori for setting the tone for the panel discussions that will now ensue. And we also thank Ms. Mizatori for outlining the important work of uh, UNDRR, offering to closely cooperate with all stakeholders required to implement the Sunday uh, framework at global, regional, and local level. So we will now um, start what we expect to be a very lively and interesting panel discussion. And to help inform and moderate our discussions today, we have Mr. Daniel Stander, Senior Advisor of United Nations Development Program. He's an international expert on resilience and serves as a special advisor to the UN in matters of disaster risk, analytics, and sustainable finance. Daniel also works closely with the private sector, advising risk management purpose-driven science and technology companies. He will also introduce today's distinguished panel. Daniel, over to you. Thank you very much, DG Zukov. It's a real pleasure to be here um, to host what is going to be a very, very important conversation with so many esteemed guests. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's waste no time. There's lots to get through today. I'd like to bring onto the stage immediately the distinguished guests who are here in person. Ekaterina, could I start with you first? Could Ekaterina Gonsatze come to the stage, please? She's the Deputy Minister for the Ministry of Finance. Thank you very much for her country in Georgia. And then I'd next like to bring Sadar Sadiq, the Minister of Economic Affairs for the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd then like to cue in someone who's joining us remotely um, from the Republic of Tajikistan. We have Ashaboy Solozeta, who is the first minister, the deputy first minister, sorry, for the Ministry of Economic um, Affairs and Trade. Um, thank you very much for joining us remotely. And then finally, we have a representative not from the Carrick region, but from another country, from Mexico. I'd love it if you could join us, Hector. Hector Santana, he's the head of insurance, pensions, and social security for the government of Mexico in their Ministry of Finance. I'm gonna do something a little bit odd before we start. I'm gonna introduce something for the people in the room and for the people on, um, on the screen if they want to. If anybody says anything that you like, where you want to show appreciation, I want some finger snaps. Okay, so if the, if, if the uh, ministers say something that you agree with, and this goes for you too on the panel, just give me a finger snap so I know, you can practice now please, so I know that we're getting some appreciation for what's being said on the stage. Um, then we won't be interrupted by applause, but we'll have those little finger snaps. That's what I'd like to do throughout this session, thank you very much. Um, so, let me talk about the, the structure, how we're going to do this. Um, there's an urgent imperative, as we heard um, from DG Zukov, to get a more risk-informed approach to human development and economic development so that we uh, address the fiscal and well-being issues in the region. There's much to discuss. What does resilient regional development actually look like? 
how do we tackle the interconnected issues of macroeconomic stability, public health, and disaster risk, and do that against the backdrop of a COVID recovery? And finally, how do we implement disaster risk finance solutions practically? So there's lots for us to get to. Um, and so the way I would like to dis structure this discussion is to begin having the conversations with the ministerial representatives here and, and also um, um, Minister uh, Solezada um, in Tajikistan. Um, and then I would like to quickly bring in some other esteemed guests who are joining us remotely. Um, and I'd like to just briefly introduce them now so that uh, you, you're aware that they're with us and listening in. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Ms. Gao Kun um, from the People's Republic of China. Um, she is the Director um, of Multilateral Relationships in the Department of International Cooperation and Rescue. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we also have um, a, a, an esteemed colleague, um, Ms. Genty Kirschwood. Um, so lovely to have you with us. Um, as you heard from Mami Mitsutori, she's the, the chief of the Global uh, Risk Analysis and Reporting Unit within UNDRR. Thank you very much for joining us. And then last but not least, uh, I can see on my screen Michelle Lees. Thank you very much also for being with us. And Michelle is the chair of Zurich Insurance, one of the largest financial institutions in the world, but also importantly, he's the co-chair of the IDF, the Insurance Development Forum, which is a public-private cooperation between the insurance industry and the sustainable development community. Michelle, thank you very much for joining us too. But it's not just the people here and the people on the screen that are part of this conversation. There are the people in the room. Keep your finger snaps going when you want to communicate with us. Um, but also there are people that are joining us remotely. And I don't want to talk at these people that are joining us remotely, the audience, for 90 minutes and then just ask them for some questions at the end. I would like to try and involve them all the way through our discussion. So we are using a technology that's called Pigeonhole today, which allows the audience to join in the live discussion. Um, and I really do encourage those in the room and those online to make use of that application. So if you're here in the room, um, please do um, log on to Pigeonhole. Um, if you're joining remotely, you can click in the top right-hand corner. There's a Q&A button, or you can scan the QR code if you've got a, a smartphone or a tablet, um, and that will launch uh, the application. Failing that, go to www.pigeonhole.at.at. The code you need is ADBMNL55. That's ADBMNL55. And you can not just pose questions, but you can upvote or downvote the questions. So if some of the questions are bad, downvote them. But if any of them are good, give them the little finger snap online so they raise to the top. And the ones that are upvoted the most will have the greatest chance of being put to our panelists. Before we get into the conversation and we hear from anybody, um, Minister Sadiq, I wanted to ask if a, a favor. Your office sent me a video only yesterday. Um, we've heard in very high level terms from DG Zukov and from uh, um, the other esteemed guests who have spoken before, theoretically, what it means to be resilient. But what struck me with the video that you sent me was the human suffering if we get this wrong or what is at stake. Um, and I'd really like to play that video um, so that we can foreground the lives and the livelihoods that are at risk if we don't fundamentally change the way we finance resilience. So is it okay if we play that video Please. straight off the bat? Please. Thank you very much. past three months, Pakistan has been ravaged by the most catastrophic floods in our history. Unprecedented rainfall and uninterrupted flooding triggered by climate change, have wreaked havoc across most of Pakistan during this monsoon season, inundating one third of the country. Over 33 million people have been affected so far. <laughs> <laughs> Majority of the people affected are deprived of basic health facilities and medicines. Around 600,000 women are expected to give birth without medical care. 
Sadly, the number of casualties and injuries is expected to increase. The devastating carnage Pakistan has experienced is a direct consequence of climate stress. The amount of rainfall in Pakistan this year has never been witnessed before. Rainfall this monsoon season has been 170% higher than the 30-year average. Some areas have experienced 700% more rain than average. These relentless torrential rains have caused devastating flash floods, hill torrents, and urban flooding. For a country that emits less than 1% of global greenhouse gases, our climate vulnerability is unfairly high, ranking among the top 8 climate-impacted countries in the world. The federal and provincial governments have been executing rescue and relief operations tirelessly, with support from the armed forces. The Prime Minister of Pakistan has formed a National Flood Response and Coordination Center, which he is heading himself, to ensure effective implementation and coordination of relief and rehabilitation efforts. However, given the unprecedented size of the calamity, the resources currently available to the government of Pakistan are not enough. Help and assistance are arriving from friendly countries and multilateral partners. The NGOs are playing their part too. Together, we can raise the required funds for food, water, medications, and tents to help provide immediate relief to those affected by floods, and to help them get back on their feet. I think it's impossible not to be moved by those images of physical destruction and human suffering, quite frankly. Our thoughts go out to the millions of people that are affected. Um, one other thing struck me from that video, Minister Sadiq, that was that help is coming in. The help is coming in from friendly neighbouring countries, that help is coming in from the development community, from the NGOs. Um, there's another community as well that you didn't mention explicitly, um, which is the private sector. Um, and I do want to ask you about the current <coughs> situation in Pakistan because we're all thinking about that. Um, but before I do, I wondered if you'd allow me to bring in Michelle Lees. And the reason I want to bring him in is because he has a very interesting vantage point, having spent his career in the private sector and the financial, in financial institutions, but now as co-chair of the IDF, where there are three co-chairs. One co-chair represents industry, that is Michelle, and then the other co-chairs are from the World Bank, a senior representative from the World Bank Group, and also Achim Steiner, who's the administrator of UNDP. And so he sits at a very interesting vantage point, which is that um, space between the private sector and the sustainable development community. So I, with your blessing, what I'm going to do is ask Michelle to share some thoughts and then we can get into the discussion if that's okay. Sure. M Michelle, the floor is yours. <coughs> thank you, Daniel, and thank you for the patience of the panelists. I would like also to say that I'm very honored to be, uh, to, to be invited uh, in, these, uh, in, these, in this conference. It's, uh, it's close to my heart, which uh, I think is, is also important. I do believe that I I owe some thanks to uh, an ex-colleague of Swiss Re, where I worked a big part of my life. Thomas Kessler was nice enough to invite me. I'm, I'm, here, I'm here definitively to pledge mainly on the public-private partnership. I, I'm, I'm deeply convinced that uh, we, we can do much, much more if we learn to work together. We work together very, very often, but I, I must say that this public-private partnership is for me something extremely important if we want to have an impact, and we need to have an impact. You mentioned that I'm uh, from the private sector. If I may say, I'm from the insurance industry. It's a very specific part of the private sector. And uh, I, uh, I deeply believe that the insurance industry can bring probably a little bit more globally to uh, the problem that we will discuss today, because uh, there are a, a few a few themes that uh, are close to uh, to our uh, worries, which which are definitely precisely what we we want to address. Resilience is is part of our DNA. Uh, I must say we have probably the most genuine motivation for that is that uh, disasters are normally paid by insurers. Unfortunately, they're not always paid by insurers because very, very often they happen in area in which insurance penetration is not where it should be. But uh, that's the reason I believe that our industry can bring a lot, but we need also probably to progress in our penetration. There are too many people on this planet who haven't heard 
ever about what insurance can bring to that. There is one notion which uh, we do believe that we are specialists, which is risk management. I personally fear that uh, in the current environment, geopolitical environment, risk management was a little bit last in the list. And I, uh, I think that that's also an added value that uh, our industry can, can bring. Daniel, you, you were nice enough to mention that besides Zurich, I'm also sharing the Insurance Development Forum. It's a joint venture between, uh, as you say, the insurers, uh, the United Nations, mainly, I must say, the United Nations Development Program, and also the World Bank. We are there to build resilience and protection for people, communities, businesses, and public institutions that are vulnerable to disasters. Mami Visitori mentioned that also, and I think that's also something that needs to be mentioned here, is that the value of investing before. You've showed a movie that unfortunately I could not see, I must say, but you showed a movie which is uh, definitely important. After the disaster, you see image which come close to your heart and you need to react. We need also to be adult enough, if I may say, to realize that would we have invested in many countries, all countries included, developed and developing, in uh, disaster risk reduction before, we would have probably less of these images. That would also support macroeconomic stability, which is another key concern in the current environment. So we usually speak about ESG, E standing for environmental, S for social, and G for governance. This conference is very important for the governance dimension. Environmental is something that we all discuss, I deeply believe that we need also to focus, and we will do that today, on the social dimension. One of the key challenges of our global world, of our planet, of humanity, is probably the social challenge. Too many people do feel that they are the losers of what is happening. And whatever we can bring to avoid this feeling would be positive. Thank you very much for organizing this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, really wise words. I'm actually going to pick up on three things that we might come back to later. One, the critical role of the insurance industry. You have an ally in me there, whether it's as risk manager, whether it's as risk transfer agent, um, or, or whether it's as capital provider. I think the societal role of the insurance industry is huge, and we should think about how to, how to do a better job of that and how to use it even more. Um, the second thing I, I thought that was uh, you know, vital that you talked about was public-private partnership and how we're going to bring that to the fore. Um, and then finally, and I think this is maybe the most important thing, how we fundamentally change the way we finance resilience from after the event to before the event. And I think that should be the theme of some of the things that we get to in the discussion. So hopefully we can come back to all of those points in due course. But now I want to turn um, to, to, to Minister Sadiq. Um, would you like maybe just to tell us a little bit about the situation in Pakistan currently and what's going on, A, with the floods, but also more generally? Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this uh, conference, as this is the need of the day. In fact, I would say that we are late by maybe a few decades uh, in deciding on this issue. And we've taken it very lightly. Um, let me give you an example. About 35 years back, we have 6 million refugees from Afghanistan, which we hosted in Pakistan. Not easy to handle. We still have about 3 uh, million refugees from Afghanistan from those times who are living, and the children and the grandchildren have also uh, been born there. Uh, in 2005, we had an earthquake killing almost 100,000 people. In 2010, we had a flood affecting 20 million people. That is where we learned the lesson. We used to have uh, flash floods, uh, rewind flash, flash uh, floods, but that was a, a, a bigger in size. 20 million people were displaced or affected because of that. We learned our lesson. We started working on uh, climate resilience, but again, I would say not as much as we should have done. Then 2012, we had a, another uh, uh, flood. This time, 2022, 33 million people have been displaced. And I re request you to send a, a, a copy of the presentation or the video to Michel also, so that he can see if anyone else has not seen. But this time, I think 
this is a warning not only to uh, the region but to the entire world if you do not think positively if you do not think uh, timely god forbid i don't want anyone to be in the situation that we are in today it's been 3 months and we are still in the process of floods it's we are not even we haven't even started recovery as yet uh, it is uh, 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 in fact this is still the relief stage after 3 months because this time the water did not come from the rivers or the melting of glaciers but this came from the top from the skies places which, which did not have rainfall in 2 years has rainfall which is 700 times more than uh, we can uh, we had in the last 30 years the average is about 3 or 500% but 1700 times 700 times it kept on raining and people were starving without food without medicine all under water sitting on, on any place they could get the helicopters could not take relief there only the land routes which were uh, available mm. uh, that was where we were sending our relief from let me also tell you this time we had a prolonged winter and in may we did not have the spring we always used to have temperature in some of the places like jackfabad for uh, increased to 54 degrees and 54 degrees on a, on a continuous period of maybe a month or so is unbearable no no air conditioning works uh, uh, it's very difficult and you have to go out so this time it was the worst ever the prediction was 40% rainfall let me tell you what um, exactly did happen i'll just go through it briefly so 33.5 million people affected 1638 deaths 12865 injured um out of 160 118 districts affected 75% of the country disruption of food supplies medicine we uh, contribute less than 1% of the carbon emissions but we are one of the first eight to be affected uh, uh, by uh, by this climate change and it is definitely climate change millions of acres of land cultivated land is is still there's water for the last 3 months our cotton crop is gone our date crop is gone rice has been affected and we are worried about the sowing period should be completed by 15th of october we might be short of wheat because it has to be dry land the water has to go down we are using pumps which donors and friends from various countries have given us we are trying to get rid of the water but there's so much water the secretary general of the united nations when he flew for an hour in the helicopter from karachi he could just see water and mm-hmm. nothing else he thought this is the ocean is this the ocean or is it uh, land that we are going on uh, 1.1 million livestock has been killed it's not a small number 23% of gdp 38 to 40% of la- labor force in agriculture has been affected 13000 kilometers of highways and roads have been affected about 400 bridges have broken the storages that the people have uh, 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 in the places where it rains less they create those storages for the times when there's no rain they have been washed away their entire saving of edible items of wheat stock and others which they keep for the entire year that has been washed away 2 million houses more than 2 million houses have been either destroyed or damaged we are going to have a severe uh, wheat shortage we are going to have um, 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 about 7 million people falling under poverty we are going to have jobless people um, we are going to face an economic crisis um image re- response was that the prime minister created a national flood response uh, 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 center basically because we see it's not going anywhere it's this one we still 3 months in the phase then there's going to be a rehabilitation then a reconstruction stage we are not even thinking about that as this moment what we have done is we've asked asian development bank world bank and undp and the donor partners to prepare the loss assessment which they are doing initial one they have uh, uh, completed 
And I think by 15th of October, we are going to get an assessment. But let me tell you, the figure is going to be mind boggling. It's going to be something that we can't even dream of funding. And how we are going to do that, we still don't know as yet. We are trying our best. We have um, uh, we, uh, we, uh, the Benazir Income Support Program is a very transparent program. We are using that program and we have provided initially 28 billion, 126 million dollars, now about in excess of 400 million dollars, 25,000 rupees per family we are providing, which is, which is almost a, less than 100 dollars. That hundred dollars they are going to survive on for how many months we don't know. Whatever money we have, we are pumping in. Um, the electricity bills of these areas we waived off. Agricultural loans worth about three hundred million dollars. We have uh, uh, stopped the payments. In fact, we might have to, you know, write off the uh, the interest portion of that. Um, it, it'll take at least six months for this water to recede. We, are, we have waterborne diseases, we have malaria, we have dengue, uh, we have snake bites, we have, uh, it's a health emergency also. And with 33 million people, I'm sure uh, many countries in Scandinavia, if you combine them together, the population is less than the one that is affected. I think never in the history of any country have 33 million people been displaced from their homes. They're sitting on high ground, Looking at the homes, they're, they're one or two room homes, which are made of mud, which is totally underwater, the, the only belonging they had. The animals have been swept away. Unfortunately, stories of children being swept away from the arms of the mother or the father are horrifying, but it has happened. It came so far. 22,000 schools have been damaged. 3.5 million children are out of school. When will they go back? How will they go back? When will the schools be established? Will they be sitting out in the open studying? We don't know in, in temperature. Winter is also coming, so we need shelter also. Um, uh, resettlement, two million houses. How do we resettle them? That's an uphill task. The 600,000 females who are expecting to give birth to children, about 2,000 children a day without medical facility, it is, it is, I mean, I can't even explain that, what they must be going through without any sort of medical facility, but we are trying to cope with it. Um, 18,000 lady health workers. The lady health workers was the closest relief uh, in the smaller villages who used to go to villages for immunization as well as, um, uh, you know, uh, basic health requirement. They themselves are homeless. They're sitting on the roads. Uh, we are short of tents, we are short of mosquito nets, we are short of medicine, you name it and we are short of. So, immediate relief and rescue is what we are doing at that uh, this moment. And uh, damage assessment is being done by our partners, including ADP. Uh, one thing we've decided that, which we decided in 2010 also, that we have to, uh, we have to go for uh, climate resilient mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure. No matter what we do, if we don't take care of it now, then we might be losing more again. So that is the key of what we are doing. Um, we have um, uh, basically, um, our, our new policy is in line. We have started that. Uh, in fact, the first uh, bidders conference took place. We are planning about 12,000 megawatts of solar. Um, and uh, that 12,000 megawatts of solar is going to be uh, uh, allowed in the existing grid stations, so about 6,000 over there. They will be connected there. We are targeting government buildings, homes, residences, schools, colleges. Uh, that is uh, in the next phase. And then we are even going for tube wells mm -hmm. where we uh, extract water. But that is something which we are discussing also. We don't want to extract too much water also because that is important. First, we were short of water because of uh, uh, climate change. And as we were discussing the water issue, expecting 40% rain, we were waiting for the rain to come so that uh, agriculture can start. We never knew that this is going to happen to us. It can happen to anybody. It mm -hmm. can happen to other countries. If we don't wake up, if we don't do something about it, if we don't uh, uh, put our act together, just conferences and talking is not good enough. Yes, the uh, idea of insurance, that is most important, but 
The idea of uh, having things in place before time is important. Mm -hmm. The idea of collectively trying to decide on this issue, then uh, insurance at a later stage also, insurance of crops, insurance mm -hmm. of uh, uh, animals, insurance of houses, uh, this, this concept has to be introduced. And I, I like the idea, uh, Michelle, thank you very much for that. Our insurance is good in Pakistan, but not in this sector. This sector is wide open. Uh, and I'm sure there are many other countries in the world which uh, are looking forward. But please learn a lesson. We have lost lives. We've lost our dear ones. We don't want anyone, anyone else to lose their dear ones. So let's up put our heads together. We need the support. We are getting support from friends, international community. Tents are pouring in. Medicine is pouring in. They pour in, and we feel it's just too less because the magnitude is so big. Mm. We are uh, we are getting a very good support from Asian Development Bank, from World Bank, from other development partners, from friends, friendly countries, even from private sector, as you mentioned earlier. The private sector is contributing to the Prime Minister's Relief Fund. Not only to that, but corporations have, uh, in, in different countries where I'm getting information because they come through us, they are, uh, the companies are matching what the employees are donating. So that is also, and some of the companies are uh, contributing quite in huge amounts, but uh, the size and the magnitude is so big, we don't know how to handle, but we have to handle. So uh, uh, this opportunity, I think, uh, we should learn a lesson from, from our loss, and uh, we should try and put our house in order. Thank you. Minister Sadiq, thank you very much. Um, lots there. I'm actually going to take the liberty of picking up on a few things. We must learn the lessons. Right? We, it's not good enough to say, this isn't going to happen to me, not in my term of office. It could happen, and we should assume it will happen and be prepared. Um, and when we get to, I think, speaking with Genty and bring her in, um, she's done a lot of work thinking about how we understand the likelihood of events and can get prepared for them. Um, there were th a couple of other things, in fact, three things that you mentioned en passant that I just want to surface. Um, the first was, you, talk, you spoke obviously a lot about flood, but you also brought in extreme heat. And climate change is a multi-headed beast. It takes its form in many different hazards, and whether that be wildfires or whether that be extreme heat, in addition to flood, let's not, think, let's not forget about what I sometimes call the silent killer of extreme heat. So I'd like that to be on the radar as well. The second thing that I'd like to surface, en passant, you mentioned um, a f looking at disasters through a female lens. Disasters impact women disproportionately to the way they impact men, and I think we need to think about that and foreground that in our disaster risk finance. Um, the final thing you mentioned, again on passant, you talked about managing your debt. Um, and I think there is, we need to acknowledge that, that, uh, that, that, that finance isn't entirely elastic. Um, and we need to um, invest in uh, disaster resilient economies. But at the same time, we need a sustainable debt burden. And how do we keep those two things in balance with one another? Um, I see you wanted to come in briefly. Please yes, do. I do. I, I'm, uh, for, for the last three months, I've been looking for that climate fund that I, I hear is available. I don't know where it's available. I hope if any one of you know where that fund is available, do let us know, please. Thank you. Well, let's talk about how we access money and where that money might come from. I'd like to bring in Ekaterina, if I may. Um, so so uh, we've heard a lot about climate change and specifically about flood. Um, but when we take it up a level to macroeconomic stability, um, so I sometimes think about it as the three C's at the moment. We're facing climate issues, yes. We're facing conflict, though, as well. And we're trying to do all this against the backdrop of a COVID recovery. Um, how do you see the situation in Georgia? How are we going to manage macroeconomic stability against that backdrop of climate, of COVID, and of conflict? Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, ADB, for inviting me and having here for this panel. Uh, and indeed, these two years were really tragic if you just look at the numbers killed because of the flood, because of the war, because of the COVID-19 for the past two years. Uh, unprecedented amounts. Some of them, all of us, all of them are caused by human activities, so to say, but some of them were and are more preventable with some more synergy and negotiations and cooperations and uh, 
uh, hearts in the uh, decision making involved and some of them are uh, more difficult to handle, like natural disasters used to happen, will happen, and we of course make it even worse with our activities, but then there are wars which are completely men, men produced. Uh, and they not only directly kill those people who are affected by the war, but also make us shift the focus from that global challenges and think about other areas and add to problems uh, which are already existing in the region. So for Georgia, Georgia is a very small country, three and seven million. So it's, it's a tiny, I don't know, village for you, I <laughs> guess. We are re very little. Uh, very small country, 69,000 square kilometers. But it's in the crossroads of Europe and Asia and North and South, and for thousands of years, you name it, every empire, every conqueror, every invader was there. So green is a new topic, but we know about the resilience, how to be resilient, to survive, to retain your identity, to retain your language, to retain your, your, your view of the future, that, that is something to do with the resilience. And I, I guess Michel said that it's, it's a human nature to be resilient. Uh, so however tragic it is to hear, we, we, we can survive anything, but then maybe we could survive with less uh, how to say, less victims, less, less casualties attached to that. So Georgia, for the COVID-19 related issues, survived quite well, we would say. We recovered, I can say easily, but it was not as bad as expected when the COVID started. We had a V-shaped recovery in 2021 and uh, for the country in the beginning. So, and for the country uh, which is heavily dependent on tourism, of course, uh, healthcare related problems are not just healthcare related problems. It affects the whole economy, 10% of the GDP attached to tourism. That's a big, big, big number. And then our export main product is wine and that's also heavily related to tourism. So that was really something that affected us significantly, but we, we recovered. Uh, how we see why we recovered uh, besides uh, the external factors, obviously that was the resilience built in our institutions. Uh, Georgia in 90s, after regaining its independence and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it, it lost all th everything, the institutions, infrastructure. For, for almost a decade, there was no maintenance, no new construction. So you can imagine we, we had to start from the scratch, building the schools, building the roads, building the hospitals. The whole system needed to be started from the beginning and within 30 years we somehow managed to do that and now every shock is an extra, extra, extra uh, difficult for the region like this. And just as we started to recover from the COVID-19, the exactly the same day the war started. So again, we went into, uh, into a different uh, episode of our lives and as our minister very often likes to joke, dealing with the crisis is national sport, sport of Georgia. <laughs> so we are in that sport of dealing with the crisis. And uh, what I wanted to say, the structural reforms, <coughs> public finance management reform, public investment management reform, fiscal risks, reporting, which was recently, not recently, it's almost already a decade, started uh, with, through the help of the different IFIs and the uh, IMF and including climate related risks in the fiscal risks assessment. These were something we were looking at even beforehand. And in 2019, we made an internal document of macroeconomic analysis internal, not, not for public distribution, and we made some scenarios there, and there was the, the very worst scenario. That, that included anything, you name it, like fantasy scenario, what could go wrong in the region, mm -hmm. including pandemics, including wars, not, not only in Ukraine, but others in the region happening at the moment. And we were like sure that scenario would never materialize. You guess. It all happened, everything materialized in 2020, 2021, 2022 has brought the worst scenario to us. So it's good if you have a system which somehow makes you prepared, though you never have a recipe and you always need to be flexible and adjusting and resilient again to, to respond to the challenges that the world brings to us. And again, we are now in that situation when uh, we estimated that because of Russia and Ukraine, both being uh, our trade partners would um, 
decrease our economic development significantly, and our original projection was that we would uh, grow by 3% instead of originally estimated 6% before the war, but we are growing more than 10%. Mm -hmm. So there were factors <coughs> which somewhat overcompensated if we just look at the raw numbers and don't see well, what's behind that, right? Shifting corridors, making this transit corridor more 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 important and more more demanding for Central Asian countries to go to the West. Uh, so these are factors that affects our immediate uh, situation. But this also needs a lot of analysis of what is what is this bringing us in the medium and long run. That could work both ways. It could be sustainable. It could be that the world will diversify <coughs> uh, further, but it could also mean that it just shifts forward whatever was to come as a potential growth in the medium term. And there are a lot of one-time factors that could then uh, make our long-term sustainability even more challenging. And as we speak today, the developments are even uh, changing. Like We are getting now new wave of Russian citizens inflows in the country. Like We had the first wave in the spring, but they were mostly people who tried to relocate with their business, with their uh, with their means, but now we see a different wave. They they just left their cars and come in on foot just to s survive, just to save them their lives. That's another wave. So we again are in the process of analyzing what it might bring to us in the immediate future and in the long term and in the short run. And this is happening as we speak. So there is nothing which can make you prepared for this. For this, but more analysis are done. More sustainable systems are in place, digital systems like during COVID, being able to amend the budget to prepare a new budget without people bringing, uh, forced to bring in the offices. We did it all uh, by people staying at homes. That was only available because we had e-budget, e-treasury, and other electronic systems. So these are very much interconnected and very much interlinked and they much uh, geopolitics influences everything and then climate and uh, to save lives and not only human lives to save the life on the planet that is something the ultimate goal of all our reforms right so i don't know i don't have an answer to that uh but michelle was right we're resilient it's, it's our nature thank you um the major thrust of what you said there was around the interconnected nature of the threats Exactly. Right? We can't just think about climate and think about that independently from public health issues and think about that independently from malicious foreign state interventions or think about energy de dependency or independency. Um, and one of the top, in fact, the top voted question that's come through from the audience is how do we get answers to that? It's one thing to have uh, understand that the stresses are interconnected. Now, how do we design solutions that respond to the interconnected nature of those stresses? I'm not going to necessarily ask you to answer that now, but I would like you to hold that in mind, unless there's something you want to come back in on right now. I just wanted to add one more thing about the signals. Mm. Uh, signals are even now for some future threats ahead, and signals were there in 2014 and in 2008, when whatever is happening now in Ukraine was happening in Georgia. But we are too small to be noticed, and it only gets noticed now. And the signals are now there too. So we sometimes just close our minds, close our eyes, and that's kind of difficult, but if we open our eyes widely and start to directly talk about the threats and yeah. not go around them and package them and fine tune them, maybe we can survive some more well, future threats. Well, here, here, here to that. I think we need to, if you will, stare into the abyss. People talk about black swan events as if they're unknowable, they're things we didn't expect. No, we can think about what those black swans are, you did, um, you did your scenario planning, um, and what came to pass was what you didn't think was going to happen. But you're already starting in the right way by asking yourself what could happen and how bad it could be. Did you want to come and say yes, something, Hector? Sorry to interrupt. I think that uh, you said before that sometimes government don't uh, want to get involved, it's not in my time, it might not happen, but precisely even if you don't have any, a negative impact in your in any period of a government, you should be prepared. You said no one is really prepared. Of course, it, it is difficult to foresee what's going to happen, but you have to build the resilience capabilities, and that's the role of government, basically. You have to make sure that people are able to be back on their feet. 
I mean, the, the challenges that Pakistan is facing now it, it underscores the need to be resilient, to be prepared, to have the, a, a proper answer to whatever reason. <clears throat> and one of the reasons is it, it takes a big effort of society to build the infrastructure that has been already destroyed. At, in the time it was, it was built, huge efforts were made to allocate resources for that purpose, and it's gone. So the first thing you have to do is make sure you're back on your feet, the people is back on your feet, that you create new conditions. And of course, from that, you have to reduce and diminish the possibility of risk going back mm -hmm. to the same place. I mean, I would say, my, my, our friend, the minister of Pakistan, please make sure you don't build exactly the same bridges in the same way. Mm -hmm. Please make sure you think where you put your hospitals, the ones that were affected. Please make sure that you think into consideration what's going on, so where you put your schools. Right. But the role of the government is to be able, one of the roles is to be able to be prepared to engage with other areas of society, international community, other actors, uh, the, the private sector. You, you have to make sure that you do whatever is necessary to react promptly. That, I don't want to extend too much, but that's precisely one of the things that I think it has to be a, really underscore. We are facing new risk, we are facing difficulties because of the new uh, planet circumstances, p politics, uh, war, uh, the pandemic, all that. You, it's, it's very difficult to think in, in terms of what might happen, what's the chances, the statistical probability. And therefore, the insurance industry can also help because they are experts on risk management. Mm -hmm. And I would say you have to be fully aware of the risk the risk you are facing, in order to be able to, not only to prevent those risks, but also to reduce the, the risk and to be, a, be able to manage. In Mexico, we have learned that the hard way yes. over, well, now I would say over 35 years. Yeah. I'll, sorry. No, there, there, there's so much there. If not the government, then whom, Indeed. right, is the first point. And why? For the people. Indeed. And then every event teaches us something new. We're always learning, and so we must, it's an, it behooves us to learn from these events and to build back better with that learning. Um, I saw the minister, you wanted to come in with something. Yes, I think um, um, I would propo propose that um, uh, in schools, colleges, universities, a subject on specifically awareness of climate change has to be introduced to the youngest of the children, so when they are growing up, they should, they should focus on that this is what we should do, and this is what can happen, and this is how we can uh, uh, avoid it. So I think if that, uh, that is uh, taken up uh, at your level, we'll try and take it up in Pakistan ourselves, but internationally, I think it could be useful. I think it's a good idea. I remember the first time my child came home and said, Dad, you work in climate change, don't you? And I'm like, uh, yeah, where's this conversation going? He said, what are you doing? <laughs> you've, you've been working at it for 30 years and we're still in trouble, but I think we need our children to be carrying this forward for us. I, I want to bring in um, the Deputy Minister from Tajikistan because he's been waiting patiently and I know how hard it is to join a conversation remotely. Um, I'm aware that your president has done a lot of work in foregrounding climate adaptation and the SDGs into uh, your new national development strategy. I wonder if you could share a little bit more with us about that strategy. And one of the questions that came through from the audience is, what are the countries doing around adaptation um, to the new normal of climate? Perhaps you could share with us. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Zolahad Zera. Thank you, uh, distinguished Vice President Chen, uh, distinguished participants. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to express my gratitude uh, to uh, organizers of this high-level session. Uh, um, and uh, the Republic of Tajikistan is directing uh, uh, its act activities to achieve the goals mentioned in the National Development Strategy. Uh, of the Republic of Tajikistan until uh, 2030. Uh, and uh, uh, it's implementing uh, certain uh, measures uh, in the areas of green uh, and sustainable development, including uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas, uh, gases and adaptation to climate change. 
Uh, in this process, uh, the implementation of uh, sectoral priorities uh, in the area of uh, adaptation to climate change in the Republic of Tajikistan, uh, take, taking into account the reductions of uh, impact of climate change and uh, the risk of uh, natural disaster by strengthening institutional capacity uh, currently in process. In regard to uh, today's topic, uh, the Republic of Tajikistan is one of the countries in the uh, Euro-Asian uh, region that is vulnerable uh, to climate change uh, and has a low level of adaptability. Uh, the negative impact of climate change uh, is already being uh, felt on the uh, sustainable development of Tajikistan economy. Extreme climate events such as floods, uh, droughts, uh, uh, avalanches, uh, landslides, etc., periodically uh, damage land resources, agricultural crops, uh, infrastructure, and other uh, livelihood. The Republic of, the, uh, as I said, at the, uh, at the same time, uh, due to the global warming uh, of the uh, air temperature, uh, the melting of uh, glaciers uh, is taking place and the level of melting uh, or, uh, uh, is higher than the formation of glaciers. According to the observation of uh, total area of uh, glaciers, uh, glaciers uh, in the Republic of Tajikistan has decreased by 30 percent uh, since 1930. In recent years, Tajikistan has been uh, addressing uh, uh, the issues uh, of low fuel uh, cons uh, consumption, uh, greater use of renewable uh, energy source, restoration of forests, and uh, improvement of land uh, use. Uh, Tajikistan has a good potential uh, in order to promote uh, green economy uh, principles uh, in uh, many sectors. Uh, we identified uh, more than 10 sectors uh, uh, in uh, where should be uh, developed uh, green economy principles uh, in Tajikistan, such as uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, ecotourism, uh, uh, exporting of uh, uh, ecolog ecological uh, uh, clean uh, uh, products, and so on. In this regard, uh, based on the instruction of the leader of nation, uh, the president of the Republic of Tajikistan, His Excellency Amul Rahmon, uh, green economy development strategy was uh, developed, uh, has been developed in uh, Tajikistan. The implementation of uh, this strategy contributes uh, to uh, ensuring sustainable development uh, in the field of uh, economy, social stability, ecological uh, balance, and increasing the level of uh, well being of the people of Tajikistan. Uh, so, uh, regarding to the implementing uh, this uh, uh, green economy development strategy, uh, we uh, should uh, strengthen uh, uh, activities in uh, the following uh, areas. First of all, strengthening of institutional foundation uh, and uh, educational standards in the direction of uh, strengthening environmental uh, education uh, and uh, equal rights. Uh, integration of the uh, principle of green economy into the system of uh, education and science. Improvement of uh, re uh, regulatory uh, legal acts, uh, standards, regulation, and implementation of green economy principles mm -hmm. in, the, in the field of protection and uh, rational use uh, of natural capital uh, and reduction of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Expansion uh, on forest areas in uh, mountains, uh, hills and along along rivers. Uh, it an intensification of the establishment of the international fund uh, for the protection of glaciers in Tajikistan. Adoption of uh, regulation uh, to prevent uh, uh, an increase uh, in uh, greenhouse gas emission in industry, uh, in the transport sector and other industries. Creation, uh, creation and new protected natural areas uh, uh, and expansion of existing areas. Development uh, of uh, state investment project in the field of green economy and uh, their presentation to international financial institution uh, and business partners. Creation uh, green investment fund 
uh, with a uh, hedge function uh, involving foreign capital. Introduction of a mechanism to sell Tajikistan share of uh, greenhouse ga gas emission to uh, leading global companies. Promotion or, uh, and identification, uh, identification of Tajikistan national brand in the sphere of green economy. Rising fund uh, through the uh, mechanism of green bond, uh, bond uh, for the uh, construction of power plants and the station based on renewable energy, energy source. Implementation of uh, program budgeting uh, in the field of green financing. Operation of the Central Asian uh, Stock Exchange in global and regional green bond markets. Creation uh, a specialized uh, public and private financial uh, institution uh, to finance uh, green uh, projects uh, by attracting finance resource of uh, development partners. Therefore, in order to achieve uh, the highest goals of uh, green and sustainable development, rising uh, the living standards of the population uh, in the context of uh, ensuring sustainable economic development, solving social problems and uh, adapt, adopting to climate change, the Republic of Tajikistan express its uh, readiness for cooperation and take all measures within the framework of international agreement recognized by Tajikistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister Fazola Zeda. Um, there's a lot there, but what struck me was the need for investment in that adaptation strategy. And there was one word that you slipped in, and I don't know whether anybody heard it, it was brand. You talked about developing your brand as a nation um, that is one that is at the forefront of the climate response. And in due course, I may, I'll put this to Michelle now, but I'll ask him to think about it and come back later, which is what do the countries need to do in order to position themselves to be attractive to private capital, not just risk capital, but project finance in order to finance the transition to the green economy that the deputy minister was, uh, was referring to. Maybe we can come back to that later. Um, I wondered if it's okay if I bring Genty in now, who's been sitting patiently. Um, Genty, I know you're deeply committed to the region. Obviously, you were a uh, deputy resident representative of Kyrgyzstan. I know in your new role at UNDRR, you're going to be in Tajikistan next week, if I'm not mistaken. I also know, because we've worked together before, that you're deeply committed to data and analysis. Um, I wondered whether you wanted to bring that lens to the conversation or whether there's something else you wanted to share with us. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. And it's, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, have a chance to be with you all today. Um, and I also to reconnect to a region that I think is really has incredible potential to uh, accelerate the next generation of green sustainable development. And I think that the comments from Tajikistan really highlight some, some key issues here. You know, climate change is changing the global map. It is shifting and it is increasing risk. So, so the traditional approaches are, are not enough. And in our complex world, we've got to be looking at that more systemic cascading risk and doing more of the same just, just isn't enough. But I think as the comments from Tajikistan and, and Mexico and others have, have really brought out clearly, there are some tools that we've got. We've, we've got risk analytics, but we need to move that to be more flexible, more agile, to move just from looking at hazards to really looking at, at vulnerability. And we need to make sure that when we're investing in vulnerability reduction, that it's really the engine for sustainable development. And I, I think that can be done. We look at the financial models. We look at how those are now being adapted to adjust and look at cascading impacts across climate and other factors. But what I think is also interesting is that we can actually develop the systems. And, and as the comments from Tajikistan brought in, we can look into the future. We can look into how our future financial markets are going to better price risk, how they're going to be able to absorb and attract sustainable investment. But we need to look a little bit more holistically and we need to make resilience building at the core of those decisions. Because if we're not building the infrastructure that is fit for 2050, if we're not climate proofing our pension funds now, we're in a sense um, creating risk that we can avoid. 
And at the same time, I think uh, a number of people have talked about this, this basket of financial tools. Insurance can be incredibly important. So can resilience bonds. So can uh, social safety nets. So can traditional humanitarian assistance. It's, it's not that there's, there's one uh, horse you need to bet on, but getting that right layering of, of risk financing approaches and creating the kinds of partnerships where you bring private sector expertise, public sector uh, understanding of vulnerability, and you create, if you like, win-win synergies across the two, I think is going to be really core to those countries that are going to lead this transition, which I think is very much going, is very much also going to inform the countries that are, are more resilient and more able to grow in, in an uncertain future. So just a few thoughts on, from my side, but I, I very much welcome uh, this discussion. And I think it gives us a lot of uh, momentum for making sure that countries like Pakistan are, are really able to learn from where we are, develop that agility, develop that flexibility, and be, be well positioned to really put uh, resilience building at the center of their next economic growth strategy. Again, again, lots there I'd like to pick up on, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little nudge here from Echo. Did you want to come in and say something? As I mentioned, if we start to talk directly, that would save us a lot of time. Uh, I'm coming from the budget department mm. background, so um, sometimes I feel like we talk a little bit, a lot on tagging and tracking and green and pink and brown and so many types of budgets and instruments and so on. So an expert would come to me from reputable organization and would say that we need to have a green budget or we need to have a gender budget. But the way we struggle is we cannot have green or gender or whatever budget unless we have them, those activities involved in the policy making on every level and on every aspect of the policy making education, agriculture, environment, and the policy making should be gender mm -hmm. equal. The policy making should be green, how we produce food, how we produce electricity. These are the things that changes might come. Otherwise, for the healthcare, there might be some recipes, but for climate change, there is not a recipe which directly affects the climate change, right? This should come through all the sectors through everything the countries are doing, people are doing so. If the, the expertise and the efforts are directed to changing those roots of policy making and decision making, and then we will obviously start to track and tag and do that in, on the upper level, but like coming to the Ministry of Finance to tag something as green in September when the budget is almost already finalized and you just need to go to the parliament, that's very, very late. So it had to be done for that year's budget, like three, four years earlier when the medium term planning was done. And also on PPP, that's a very, how to say, I won't use the word, that's a very popular uh, topic. Like, it's, it's, of course, we share the responsibility and we need to share with public and private instruments. That is very helpful and very, very, very important. But again, public-private partnership works when the risk is also shared, that, that when we partner in risks. If you come that 100% risk is government side and the 100% benefits is on the private side, that's a public guarantee. That's mm -hmm. not a public-private partnership, right? So these are then details which come on during discussions. So I'm, these are things that needs to be directly addressed and on policy making and decision making levels and then we can do all those colorful taggings and trackings. Thank you. Yeah, well, very good. If I can summarize, what we need to do is move from the fashionable fads, right? And how are we going to do that? We're going to change behavior by putting resilience and resilience thinking at the core of everything we do and then look longer term. That's my summary of what you said. And I think there was something there from Genty too, because I talked about staring into the abyss. Uh, Genty uh, congratulated the, the deputy minister from Tajikistan for being forward looking. Um, and it's not just staring into the abyss of the bad things that could happen, it's looking into the horizon for the good and the positive transition. And um, 
I, I, you know, I was, I was struck, uh, Minister Sadiq, when you talked, when you started talking, the first thing you said before you talked about the floods that have just happened was you looked in back in history of what's happened in the past. And I think it's really important that we do look into the past because the past is a valuable teacher. However, we know the past is a very poor precedent for the future in terms of frequency, severity, and location of risk and hazard. Um, and I wondered, Hector, if I could bring you in um, to ask how you in Mexico think, if you like, probabilistically about the future. And then I see that uh, Ms. Gow has rejoined the connection. I want to bring her in too to understand um, how they think about that in the People's Republic of China too. But you first, please, Hector. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that you have to prepare for the future. I mean, the only way forward is the government and society are prepared. I agree with Caterine when she says, uh, if the government puts 100% and, and absorbs the whole risk, then it's not a partnership. And uh, one, precisely one of the strategies I mean, that we have adopted in Mexico for the future is to transfer some of the risk to the private sector. That way we ensured with the CAD bond and the, and the catastrophe insurance policies that the government has adopted, precisely to guarantee prompt response. Mm -hmm. That way we transfer some of the risk. We are fully aware that at the end of the day, all things go wrong. At some point, the risk will come back to the government. That's what's going to happen, because we will be uh, really, we have the responsibility to answer to the people and to put the people first. That's the key issue. I would say we want to be resilient so that we keep and protect the people's welfare. It doesn't matter. I, I don't only refer to fads. I will say also political colors. It doesn't matter the right. color of your politics, right. how bright and brilliant and perfect it is. The problem is what you have to develop for the future. And the future has to begin to be built today. And that's why I agree with the minister when he said, would you, would you have to invest in education for to understand uh, the, the need for climate change and on the risk associated to that changes in the planet. Mm -hmm. But also you have to find answers today. And you cannot necessarily wait. It takes a generation. And I can tell you now, for instance, in Mexico, that it's now in the educational programs and the government is developing ESG criteria. And even our uh, uh, affordable program, pension private uh, link uh, uh, funding, is closely associated now to invest with ESG criteria. Mm -hmm. However, you need to find answers today as well. And uh, you deal what you have. I mean, in 25 years, we have developed a culture of prevention and people know exactly how to behave when we have an earthquake and what, what to do in the case of a hurricane is coming, how to protect yourself. We have improved quite a lot on that. And of course, now we are investing in education. But the key, for me, the key issue is that you have to think of the, in the future, whatever you do should be orientated to guarantee the welfare of the people. And one of the things that governments can do, because you know, it's hard to imagine, invest money that may perhaps you don't know exactly when you are going to use it. You have other priorities. You have political pressures. That's absolutely the case. However, you really need to think that at the end of the day, what you want is the people to be safe and to be protected. And it's not that easy just to, to implement the right policies to do so. And that's why the long term is vital. <clears throat> we have learned from experience, so I, I wouldn't uh, throw away the experience. You learn from experience, mm -hmm. you improve from experience. But of course, you have to, be, to have the, your eyes in the future. And the future is uncertain, and that's why it's relevant that you begin to collect data and sinistrality is relevant, and to understand what are the risks involved, it's relevant. It doesn't mean that you, don't, you will know exactly when and Correct. how it's going to affect you. Correct. But at least you will have some data. So I would say to all people, all governments, if you don't have no idea what to do next, begin to understand and to assess your risk. Once you assess your risk, you may be able to define a strategy and a route to face it and to guarantee the resilience of your society. Well, I, I totally agree. And, and I think it's fair to say, just because we don't know when the bad thing will happen, that doesn't mean we can't say it will never happen, and it doesn't let us off the hook from understanding how likely it is to happen, how bad it would be were it to happen, and what we could do now to get ahead of that issue. I think, I think that's critical. I, I, I want to bring in Ms. Gao, because she's been waiting patiently, and I think... Ch 
I'm, not, I'm hoping she's not frozen on the screen and she can hear us. Oh, there she is. Um, and I, can, I know that China's shown a lot of leadership um, in the issues, um, obviously being the chair of CARIC at the moment, um, but um, you've taken a lot of leadership with regard to uh, institutionalizing a holistic approach to risk and risk management, kind of what uh, Ekaterina was describing. Um, I wondered whether there was something you wanted to share from the lessons that you're experiencing in China that would be helpful for everybody. Hello, everyone. Dear distinguished uh, delegates uh, from different countries, and uh, here I would like to first of all thank KDB and also the Ministry of Finance of China for inviting me here to attend this meeting. And uh, I think this is a very uh, important event uh, that could make us uh, sit together and to share something in common and also explore the future ways to address the uh, uh, risks. And actually, after hearing all the uh, brief introductions as well as the comments from the different uh, distinguished guests, and uh, I would like to highlight uh, uh, one thing that is, uh, you know, everyone in this room at this meeting uh, already mentioned about the uh, the, the uh, three C, as we said, climate change, conflict, COVID-19, and all those uh, uh, different risks and hazards that we are facing now today. And uh, also, I uh, take note that um, we have today a lot of delegates from the financial and uh, economic sectors. And I myself not expert in this field, but uh, I, I do uh, value the knowledge and the comments that uh, uh, delegates already shared and based on the different national conditions as well as uh, uh, different uh, backgrounds. Um, so we're talking about the development, especially the sustainable development, but uh, when the issue comes to the development, we cannot not ignore the issues of disasters, as well as the public health, as well as uh, uh, multi-hazards uh, multi and the systemic risks. Because why, why we speak that? Simply because uh, um, the sustainable development gains can be washed away in a few minutes by a single disaster. We're not talking about the systemic or compounding or uh, cascading disaster risks. And just one single disaster could wipe away all of our development gains. So from the point of view of the financial and economic sectors, definitely we have to think about how to prevent such kind of things happening happen and uh, how to mitigate the impact. And uh, as you say that uh, I'm from the Ministry of Emergency Management and uh, our major task is prevent and reduce uh, natural disaster risks as well as uh, mitigate the impact, conduct the rescue and relief work as well as uh, carry out the rehabilitation and the reconstruction work uh, in, the ma uh, in the aftermath of the disaster occur occurs. Um, so, the China already, our government already paid great attention to this because we're always trying to explore many different uh, uh, the, the approaches to address the risks and the consequences uh, exposed by the, by, by the hazards and uh, disasters. And uh, so the reality is that, is that uh, I, I won't spend much time on that because all our guests already mentioned that uh, the nowadays uh, worldwide situation is not happy, definitely. It's uh, quite negative and we face uh, many, many uh, uh, negative factors which, quite, uh, which could drive us into a terrible consequence. And so how we are dealing with those uh, uh, risks and then how we respond to those uh, climate emergencies and uh, uh, disaster risk increasing trend and uh, uh, as well as a COVID-19 uh, impact. Uh, so that uh, comes to the very important and critical uh, task for the government is uh, risk management, disaster risk management and risk governors. Uh, including from this point of view, also it's including insurance, financial interventions and financial transfer tools. That's, I think, uh, why we are sitting here today to discuss all of these issues that uh, how the carry countries to leverage the financial tools and the financial resources to mitigate the 
the the the the impact of the disasters. Actually, in China, I would like to uh uh brief you on the uh China's government's uh, uh most important uh, approach is uh, that this year, 2022 in July, we adopted a national comprehensive disaster prevention and mitigation plan, which is a guideline. And we see this is a gospel for China, for, for the government and also for the government at all levels to follow, to implement uh, the measures to uh, to conduct the relevant DRR work as, so, as well as uh, um, the, the response and the rehabilitation and reconstruction. Um, so this is a very important uh, tool and also the guideline for us to uh, to implement. And in that guideline, it's highlighted the important role of the financial resources. Because why? It's simply uh, clear that without financial resources, both uh, before the disaster and after the disaster, we can do nothing. We can't help our people. Like our distinguished guest from Pakistan uh, minister said that uh, when the disaster comes, when the flood comes, and uh, we have no time to, to effectively organize all, all the things immediately in a short period. So for this reason, we have to prepare everything in advance. That's why we have to have our financial resources available uh, at, uh, at just before the disasters. So this is also mentioned in our planning that is uh, uh, that the government has strengthened the effort to ensure the availability of the financial resources. And uh, we have the government uh, uh, finance resources uh, allocated uh, into a specific account every year just for the purpose of disaster response and relief. And also, definitely, part of that uh, uh, that uh, financial resources are also diverted to the prevention work. But here, I would like to highlight one thing: is that there also is a gap at the moment that uh, uh, both our government and also our ministry faces. That is, uh, um, you see, the large share of the financial resources goes to the response, emergency response, and relief as well as reconstruction and rehabilitation. Less compared with this large share uh, of the financial resources only goes to the prevention. That's why you see UNDR uh, always highlighted the importance of the prevention and uh, risk reduction. So I think this, this is a gap that we are facing now, but in our plan, it's already uh, mentioned and uh, highlighted the importance, significance of the uh, pre-arranged and the pre-organized financial resources for the uh, for for the prevention work and also the investment should be uh, should be embedded into the uh, prevention work. And uh, so we also, meanwhile, we have uh, uh, established and improved the relevant mechanism to mobilize, encourage and mobilize more financial, uh, more social financial resources into the DRR work. So this is quite uh, different from what we had before because, uh, uh, you know, we always think that the disaster relief work and the UN disaster prevention work is much of the responsibility of the government rather than the private sectors. But this year in our plan, it's highlighted that we should encourage and mobilize more social financial resources should be put into this uh, work as well. So uh, from this point of view that uh, once we have this uh, financial resource available, and uh, that means we could do more to prevent the uh, disaster risks and, mean, and uh, the, the, the disaster, uh, disaster risks and the mitigation of the impact. And uh, so we, we have also, I would like to mention a little bit about the insurance programs at the moment in China. You, you see in China at the moment, this is not uh, widespread uh, insurance schemes and the programs, it's just uh, in some provinces, uh, we have the pilot uh, projects, and uh, which uh, also uh, that we have seen some kind of effect, and uh, but it's mainly supported by the government. 
it's uh, less involved the uh, the the private sectors and private resources. So in this uh, uh, on this issue and uh, uh, in this respect, we are still at the very beginning stage. We are ex still exploring the more effective and the more um, adaptive approaches to these issues. That uh, I think with the uh, uh, information sharing experience, sharing with the carry countries as well as uh, assistance from AD. And we could finally uh, find out, uh, you know, the most uh, or the best way to uh, to explore how the uh, insurance uh, schemes and uh, financial tools better uh, our risk reduction work. That's all my speech. Thank you very much. Very, very, very helpful. Very. Um, I'm going to summarize again, if I may. I heard two things that were super important. We need to fundamentally change how we finance risk. The vast majority of the capital is spent ex post, cleaning it up, and we need to move that to ex ante. And the second thing I heard was about international cooperation, whether that be with the other countries in the Carrick region or with your private sector partners or your development partners. Um, I'm going to come to Michelle in a minute. I'm going to tell you the question, Michelle, because I would like your views on how we make that fundamental shift, how we help the countries make the fundamental shift to financing disasters before they happen rather than afterwards. Um, but before we get there, I would like to come to you, Hector, on international collaboration. CARIC is uh, a regional program. And you know, my um, earliest memory of Mexico was the 1985 earthquake. You've gone on a huge journey over the last, you said, 35 years. I recall only a few years ago, you as a country, along with the rest of your Pacific Alliance members, which was Colombia, Peru, and Chile, placed the largest catastrophic risk bond at that time in history for an earthquake bond into the private sector. Um, could you just spend, it, let me ask you this question this way. If you had one lesson learned from how to do international collaboration well on a regional level to put in place regional risk financing, what would that lesson be to the CARIC? Well, you, again, you learn from experience and what we have uh, found is that uh, sharing experiences and sharing the difficulties usually help to identify similar paths to solve the problem. Uh, now in, in the Pacific Alliance, we are working not only for, with earthquakes and prevention, and we are now evolving also to incorporate some other risks for the, for the region, and uh, specifically pandemic risk and also uh, flooding and drought. So these are, uh, now as we speak, we are working on those because we have learned that it makes sense to share risk. I know, again, once you share the risk, it helps everyone to get back in our feet. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't disappear risk, it only helps to react promptly. And that's one of the important lessons. And the other lesson, if I may abuse on your time for a <laughs> second, is that we have been developing with the IDF precisely a, a parametric insurance policy to protect corn producers in mm -hmm. four of the most uh, the private states in Mexico at the subnational level, and the idea is to protect those that are the most vulnerable people, mm -hmm. because they only, they not only lose a crop, but they lose their livelihood, and they lose their ability to react and to be part of the Mexican economy. And uh, the pilot is now basically uh, undergoing, yep. and we will be having uh, some answers of, of the results. <clears throat> and from that, we plan to, obviously, to improve the, the system, the mechanism, and hopefully with the IDF uh, assistance to escalate and to expand it to benefit more people and to give them, first of all, an acknowledge of how to protect them from risk, mm -hmm. and again, what we can do to diminish those risks. Mm -hmm. They won't disappear. We have to make sure, be, be aware. You can control, you can reduce, but you have to be prepared. Correct. And uh, in the case of Mexico, in 1985, we had an earthquake, 8.1 er degrees earthquake, over 25,000 lives were lost, thousands of buildings in Mexico City were lost. 37 years later, after the drill to commemorate the, the, the anniversary of the first earthquake in 2017, on September 19, we have an a new earthquake, 
at 7.1 earthquake, but it was even a very strong one. And uh, this time we have less than 1,000 life lost. And then when is the next earthquake going to happen? Well, on September 19, 2022, one hour after the national drill to commemorate the 85 and the 2017 mm. earthquakes, we have a new earthquake, 7.4 earthquake. And it was almost mesmerizing for all of us because we were just returning to our offices, to our activities after the exercise, the drill, and we have this earthquake. And uh, luckily, only two lives were lost. That's a, a very simple way to understand that you cannot prevent risk. You cannot choose when risk is going to appear. Disaster may arise, but you, have been, and you, have, you can prepare. And international cooperation helps. Mm -hmm. And go and find those experts. And I also would like to say to our friends here at the CAREC and our friend, the Minister of Pakistan, that if you, you may find the Mexican experience useful, it's at your disposal so that we can build Thank a you. better planet for us all. Thank you. I mean, if I, if I go to the thrust of what you are saying is you are all open to sharing and learning from each other. But, um, and the region is very heterogeneous. Um, and there are lots of differences between the countries in the regions. But if we have the humility, and I think, um, Minister Sadiq, if I may say, you showed a lot of humility in describing what it was your country was going through. It takes a lot of humility to ask for help. Um, but if we bring that to the and table... Brave. Bravery. And to, to, at the end of the day, we are all humans, and that's what unites us, and we are all in this together. Um, I'm going to come to... Eka, I know you want to speak, but I wanted to ask Michelle if he would come in. Um, do you have any wise words for us, Michelle, on how we make this fundamental shift to help, fundamentally, governments um, finance risk ex ante and not ex post? I don't think I will, I will add a, a, a lot. I, I just would like to, to say a, a short hello also to Hector, who has been very instrumental in the way in which Mexico is also leading the pack in, in some of these aspects, and uh, also to Genti, who, who is very, very active in the UNDR. Uh, I, I, I want to share with you a, a short experience. You know, I used to uh, head in my previous life as a ranger a unit called Global Partnership. I visited a lot of government uh, and a lot of finance ministry. I met all the bankers, all the usual suspects. I never met an insurer as a finance minister. So that, that is something which I do believe, and that was at, at the time the dream that we should have, and the industry took time also to introduce the concept of chief risk officer. We should have in all countries a country risk officer, somebody who is taking care of identifying the risk, uh, the natural one, but not only the natural one, and I do believe that this concept of minister of risk, if you want, or country risk uh, manager would make, uh, would make a lot of sense. There is uh, an important aspect there is also the, the way in which we can ensure sovereignty, sovereign insurance. A lot of the infrastructure of countries are not insured for reasons which probably is due also to the fact that we were probably a little bit too discreet. But uh, I, I do believe that sovereign insurance is something which is very important. And that depends definitively on the development of global risk modeling. If you have a model to know about what are the risks you can attract private capital, if you don't have a model, it's difficult to introduce a parametric recovery, as Hector did mention. So this global risk modeling alliance, which is part also of what we try to develop, not alone at IDF, is extremely important in my view because that brings a knowledge of the risk which attracts the capital. I must also say that uh, there is another dimension which is called the Global Resilience Index. Standards and Poor's, Moody's and the full family are always analyzing the financial situation of the countries. There is not a lot which is said about the resilient situation of the countries. And we are definitely at IDF trying to work that beside the financial situation, there is also a level of resilience maturity, which is expressed in this famous AAA, AA, single A. Because I do believe that is also something which will bring a lot in matters of uh, attraction of private capital. And then last but not least, when we speak about, uh, you know, anticipating instead of paying after, 
we touched something which is quite simply the infrastructure. How do you make sure that you attract private capital in infrastructure? And uh, there, there is enough. You know, if you take all the pension funds of all the countries around the world and the need of infrastructure investment in some developing countries, but not only in developing countries, you know, uh, there are also developed countries which are quite poor in their infrastructure. There is a, a, a nice connection. The, the big problem is that because of currency risk, construction risk, political risk, these assets are not investment grade. And therefore, they are not investable by, by the, the players of the, of the private sector, if I may say. Let me just mention one case. A few years ago, the International Finance Corporation, IFC, launched a program called the Matched Co-Lending Portfolio Program, MCPP, whereby they agreed to structure portfolio loans of already built assets with the first loss protection. I'm not speaking of 100% for the private sector or 100% for the public sector. I'm just speaking of making a part of this investment investable for classical private sector representative. It was granted by the Swedish government and these loans were sold to a lot of private investors and they were able to get an investment grade rating for their portfolio. This transaction freed up the capital at AFC. So there are solutions which are feasible. But I must say the, the modeling is extremely important to attract really investors. And I insist, and we will still continue to fight on the fact that having a global resilience index, which is seen by many investors beside the classical standards and poor's and Moody's index, would be extremely valuable for the private sector appetite in developing the infrastructure, which is the key element of anticipating instead of waiting the event to happen. Speak to my Speak heart to my there when you talk about the modeling. I, I sometimes say, or there's an old adage, right, that uh, um, you, you can't manage it if you can't measure it. I like to flip it on its head. If you can model it, then you can securitize it, meaning you can pass it into the financial markets. If you can't model it, you can't securitize it. And that's why I think uh, what Michelle said is spot on. And I know, Genty, you would have made a similar point if we hadn't been running out of time, um, which unfortunately we are. And so I do need to wrap up and then have some closing remarks. But Eka, you, you caught my eye. Was there something you wanted to say? Um, if you can be brief, and then I would have gonna ask Min Minister Sadiq if he had a closing thought. I'll be very brief and I will take from what Michelle just said. Modeling is very important, but then modeling also has a side effect. It can be also manipulated. So it's also important what we are modeling for. Uh, natural disaster is hard to predict and it's harder to make somebody invest pre, uh, in front. But when we talk about the second C, like conflict, uh, not many people know maybe that Georgia was invaded by Russia in 2008, but even less people know that in 2006, the pipeline exploded between Russia and Georgia, and we were left out of gas in a very, very cold, cold winter. And uh, Nord Stream happened after Georgia was invaded. Nord Stream continued after Crimea was invaded. Investment was there, model for sure was there. What I'm saying is that signals, now the Europe especially is very afraid of the winter coming. It could be a signal and lesson to the eastern part of the world as well. Do we see this, those signals or not? These are something what should be taken into the model account. What are the correct criteria, correct indicators so that they are not, I don't know, manipulated in a right or a worse way. So this is just what I wanted to say that you might invest, but you, you should be aware of what you are investing well, in. I, I'm pleased you said that. One of my other sayings is all models are wrong, some are useful. And um, if you ignore them um, or you don't understand them, then, then they're not very useful. So I think it's a, it's a good point. Minister Sadiq, we've heard a lot from people around the world um, and from people at the interface between the public and private. And before I sum up, was there anything you wanted to say? Yes, I think um, um, I've heard a lot today. I've learned a lot today. But now we need to focus on what we need to do. How do we move forward? How do we move ahead with opinion and advice from all the experts uh, here and sitting um, far away? We need to put a document in place, yeah. things to do before disaster, things to do after disasters, what to do, what not to do. I mean, we should now start focusing and maybe ADB can form a subcommittee to work out proposals, uh, 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 specific proposals for each region, each area we're talking of. 
and it it can uh, it would it would mean not only mean uh, earthquakes it could be floods it could be pandemic it could be conflicts but we need to now focus and uh, advise uh, the region or the uh, countries what need to be done thank you very much that's actually a very useful segue but before i segue i'm going to try and wrap up. And I say try because I really hope some people were taking notes because there were lots of good, there's nodding in the room, thank you very much for the note takers, because there were lots of themes there. I'm going to tell you what I remembered. Right? What I remembered is we need to fundamentally change the system of the way we finance risk and finance disasters from uh, ex post to ex ante. I heard that we need to m m put resilience and resilience thinking at the core of our policy making. I heard that we need to think about resilience holistically and I'm going to mention something that you mentioned, which is that there are so many dimensions to resilience, even cultural resilience, we need to think about as well. I want to also foreground a gender lens, which you kindly brought up for us. I want to also bring up the fact that private capital is waiting in the wings, but we need to make ourselves attractive to those markets. And as we heard from Tajikistan, brand ourselves as the place to invest. But we're not going to get any investment, I heard, unless we can model the risk. And we can model the risk, but then we need to understand those models and be prepared to accept them. Those models aren't going to tell us when the bad thing's going to happen, but they're going to tell us what could happen. And then we, can't, we mustn't shirk our responsibility. Because if it's not government, then who is it? And why are we doing it? We're doing it for the people, the most vulnerable people. These are the things that I heard this afternoon. Um, there was much more, I know. Um, last thought from me. We heard a bit about the three C's, right? We heard a bit about climate, we heard about post-COVID recovery, and we heard about conflict. I've been thinking, what, what is the solution? And I'm not 100% sure, but I wonder whether there's a three C's solution, whether that three C's solution might be capital, might be collaboration, and it might be ADB and Carrick taking the way forward for us. So um, if it's okay, I'd like to uh, bring Cindy up to stage. So, so Cindy Malvicini um, is extremely committed to the region. You've just returned, I think, from your stint in Uzbekistan. Um, would you please, um, I'd like to, you to take us forward. We heard from Minister Sadiq about what is ADB gonna do and what does action look like? Perhaps you could drive that for us. First of all, who's excited about actually having an in-person event um, for Carrick after two years? Wasn't this great? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, panelists. This is, um, this is a lot of energy up here. I, I'm sure you all felt it. I hope online you felt it the same way and that next year you can uh, join us. Um, there, there's one thing that it started out very sobering when we looked at that video, yeah? Um, and we, we are empathizing with, with the 33 million affected people in Pakistan right now. And Minister Sadiq, you didn't say it now, but um, you said it yesterday to me, and that your greatest fear is that we will just forget. We will just forget and we will go on to until the next disaster, right? So what we heard today from all the experts around and the experiences of Georgia and Mexico and Tajikistan and others and is that we have to plan. We have to actually prepare. We have to be honest in our analytics and in assessing what those threats were, um, that they are. And um, we have to educate. This is the other thing that really came clear. We have to invest before it happens. Um, with insurance, and I'm going to tell you about a, a project that we're working on um, with resilient infrastructure that's honestly looking at that to make sure that we are uh, approving some things and doing new development that is not going to just be washed away. Um, that our systems are really resilient, that are, we're making the resources available ahead of time. Um, and then you concluded on the right note, that we need con connectivity and partnership and learning from one another. So we need to continue this conversation. Toward that end, ADB is very committed. Um, you, you heard from Vice President Chen's remarks that uh, we, are, we are trying to morph into more of a climate bank and more of a resilient, forward-looking um, partner to our clients and our developing member countries. And to that end, we are really increasing our staffing. Even within the Central and West region, we have a new team that is looking at climate and disaster resilience. We have um, new units at the central level 
we have an active discussion about a reorganization that will really boost our, our um, climate and disaster resilient resources. Um, and I'd like to tell you about a technical assistance that we have ongoing that is really supporting disaster risk financing solutions. So the things that Michelle and others were talking about on the panel, we're there ready to help you do. Um, this project is developing a disaster risk transfer facility in the Carrick region. It's making disaster risk profiles available for each Carrick country. It also provides access to a multi-hazard probabilistic modeling platform with the capacity to measure the economic benefit of disaster risk reduction measures and disaster risk transfer solutions. The project team is working on a regional structure to transfer disaster risk to the capital market for flood and earthquake hazards and discusses a regional risk financing framework for infectious diseases as well. Other technical assistance projects that we're doing under the Carrick platform support the development of disaster risk financing solutions and enhancement of the requiring, required enabling environment at the national level. We've heard many more interesting ideas um, that you can trust that the, the Carrick Secretariat and planning further knowledge events and in planning further technical assistance will take forward. So we of course need our partners. This work could not, this, this conversation could not have happened with our part, without our partners today, and the work that uh, we need to do together cannot be achieved by any single country or any single international organization. We need to closely collaborate with all the countries in the region, with other development partners, such as UNDP and UNDRR, thank you for being very much with us today, as well as with the private sector to mobilize innovative finance solutions and increase sustainable regional investments in the area of climate resilient infrastructure, public health sector, energy transition, as well as disaster risk preparedness and response. So I'd like to thank all the participants today, as well as the 180B team who actually, uh, at the background, prepared for this event, um, and our regional cooperation division, headed by Leziza and Saeed, that, that really worked on this, our financial se uh, sector group of the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department, and ADB for organizing this. We're very grateful for all of those that made this happen and for your active participation today. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you very much. Stay safe, plan ahead, be committed to not forget. Thank you.